I love this church. You've heard those words many times echoed by myself, Randy, and some other pastors. I love our church. And it's not saying, we're not trying to brag about Restoration Park Church. You know, we're not without sin here at RPC. What we're bragging about is what God is doing through his people. People who are willing to humble themselves before God and say, here I am. Grow me, mold me, shape me. Use me for your glory. And man, he shows up in mighty, mighty ways. You know, our mission statement is Christ revealed, people restored. The more that Christ is revealed in our lives, the more that we are restored. And the more that we are restored, we're positioned to restore other people. It's not our doing, it's God's doing through us. And yesterday for Restore Ministry, man, they rocked the house yesterday. If you saw Randy's Facebook post, they were lined up for the clothing giveaway 15 minutes prior, all the way down the church. Cars absolutely everywhere, yes. <laughs> Neil and Peg back there, you wanna wave? You guys, thank you guys, God bless you guys. They had so many volunteers helping out. I mean, just what an amazing thing that they are helping restore people. And as they are restoring people, Christ is being revealed through the simple acts of loving someone. So thank you guys for doing that. And I love our mission statement, Christ revealed, people restored. And it brings us really to this series that we're in now. It's called Us For Them. And the most important word in there is the one in the middle, for. Us, for them. You heard Ethan kick this off two weeks ago, talking about we're not called to fix anybody. We're not called to save anybody. It's not our responsibility. Our job is to be there for them. It is God's job to fix someone up. It's God's job to clean them up. He just wants us to be available, to be used. Now, early on in my ministry, I had what they call a savior complex. I thought it was on me to save people, to fix people. And you start counseling people, you recognize, I can't fix anybody. I can't fix anybody. And when God said, listen, Chad, I don't need you to do that. I want you, I want to use you, I want to be glorified through you, but I don't need you to do what I do. Just be available. A friend of mine said, your greatest ability is your availability. Be there. Let me do that job. And let me tell you something, what a burden lifted off our shoulders. The outcome isn't on you. It's just being for them. And then we heard from Randy last week talking about Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats verses. And they're so super convicting. When you read that, when Christ says, when you serve the least of these, the least dignified of these, you're serving me. And when you haven't, you haven't served me. Now, I know that when, if Christ would walk into this church and come up to the front, you guys would all want to run and, and, and sit at his feet and, and worship and be in reverence and want to meet him. And Christ says, you want to find me? You want to know what I look like? Go serve the least of these. Because when you serve them, you are going to find me in them. And so it helps us when it comes to serving people. We're not just serving people, we're serving Christ himself. And he'll reveal himself to us along the way, which leads me to today's message. And I'm really excited about that. We're going to look at John 13, where Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. And I've been hearing this message from God to me personally for the last 18 months. I'm going to tell you something. I'm sick and tired of it. I pray, God says, Chad, wash feet, wash feet, wash feet. I hate feet hate feet. I'm tired of it. But there's something powerful about this story of Jesus washing feet. How it can be for them. And if we apply this to our life, it has the ability to transform us, to help us to walk in freedom. It's a very simple, it's very simple sometimes in understanding, but it's very challenging to play out. Before we get into the foot washing scene, just right after that, I want to frame this message around this verse here in John 13, 34. After he washes the feet, he says this really 
powerful verse. He goes, a new command I give to you. I'm sure their ears perked up. What's this new command, Jesus? To love one another. Whoa, whoa, hold up. Isn't that an Old Testament principle? Aren't we called to love God and love neighbor as ourself? Jesus says, a new command I give to you, to love one another as I have loved you, love one another. The people will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. And how is this a new commandment? Well, I'm thinking sometimes for us, in the English-speaking world, we only have one word for love. And love becomes kind of abstract. What's it mean to love? Like, I love my wife. I love my kids. I also love brownies and peanut butter and chocolates. I love the Bengals, unfortunately. I love the Reds. I love the Buckeyes. And I hope you know there's a different kind of love when it comes to loving my wife and loving peanut butter and chocolate. Although sometimes my wife thinks I love peanut butter and chocolate more than her. Which I say, it never talks back to me when I have it. <laughs> peanut butter and chocolate never gives me attitude. I'm just teasing. I'm, pray for my wife. She has to live with this all the time. But something about peanut butter and chocolate, though, it just, if you're having a bad day, why does chocolate do that for? It's just kind of like, it's like you have cracks, and it just kind of fills the cracks up in your heart, doesn't it? I, I, I sidetracked there, I'm sorry. But when it comes to love, it can, be, it can be, you know, how do we love? How do we love God, and how do we love our neighbor? What's that actually look like? In the time of Jesus, they didn't have one word for love. They had several words for love. And the one he refers to here in John 13, 34 is what we call agape. And I'm sure you heard what agape is, but I want to define it for you in case you haven't. This is what agape means. It's unconditional love that transcends and persists regardless of circumstance. No matter what is happening, you're still loving unconditionally. It goes beyond just the emotions, just how I feel about somebody. It goes past that to the extent of seeking the best for others. It is the highest form of love and charity. It is the way that God loves us. It's the way that he is for us. And it is the way that he asks us to love them. He asks us to have that kind of love for neighbor. But he wants to clear up any confusion. I mean, honestly, what's love in our neighbor look like? What's it mean to love my neighbor unconditionally? What if my neighbor doesn't believe like I do? Maybe they're not even a Christian. Maybe they're steeped in sin. Maybe they're a thorn in my side. I don't even like my neighbor. How do I love my neighbor? And we can justify in our minds what that could look like. But Jesus wants to clear up any confusion on what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. He's going to really define for us concretely the greatest commandment, loving God and loving your neighbor. What's neat about this is that it follows this passage here. John 13, 34, 35 follows when he washes the feet of the disciples. And that's on purpose. So we're going to look here in John 13, verses 1 through 15. I'm going to read all the way through it at first. I'm going to kind of go back and share a couple things. There's so much happening in these verses. And I'm, I think God's got something for us today uh, in these verses. So picking up here in John 13, it'll be on the screen. Verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. 
Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now. But afterward, you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I, am, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. There's so much going on in these verses. It's the, it's the only record of this foot washing is in John. We don't see it in any other gospels. And this is the last supper scene. He's having a meal with his disciples, a meal that he longed to have. And in the middle of the meal, he gets up, takes off his outer garments, puts on the towel, gets a basin of water and gets on his knees and starts to wash the feet of his disciples. I mean, why is he doing this? Many scholars, pastors, and churches will say that this is symbolic of the cross. That what you're seeing here is the cross. And I think they're absolutely right. It is symbolic. I mean, if you look at what Jesus does, he is sitting at this table. It would have been a U-shaped table. And he was in the middle of the table, a place of honor, a place of authority and power. And he gets up. He takes off his outer garments. That's pretty significant because the outer garment represented someone who was a priest, a rabbi, a teacher. In the Old Testament, the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, would take off their robe and would carry a sacrifice into the temple for the sins of him and for the people of Israel. Taken off the garment was taken on the sin of the people. And so when Jesus gets up and takes off his garments, he's going to be taken on the sins of disciples. It's the cross. At the cross, he was, he was stripped naked. He was naked. Taken on the sins of the world. And then he gets a towel that represents a servant. And we see in Philippians that he lowered himself to become like one of us, became obedient even to death on a cross. The ultimate servant died for us. And then he starts washing feet. He didn't have 12 towels, 12 basins. He had one basin, one towel wrapped around him. He's got 24 feet, 12 disciples, nasty, nasty feet. They may have had sandals or not, but there weren't paved roads. There was no I-70, I-75, no vehicles. They were walking on dirt, and animals walked on these same roads. There was animal feces on the road. They literally had crap on their feet. And Jesus gets on his knees, and the dirt that is on them transfers to him. And the more he washes, the dirtier, the more soiled he becomes. It's the cross. It's absolutely the cross. And then he gets back up, takes off his robe, or takes off his towel, puts back on his garment, and sits down back at his place. The garment also represents his glory. And at the cross, when he commends his spirit, when he dies, then he raises from the grave three days later. That's exactly what he's, he's been seated at the right hand of the Father. So when we look at the foot washing scene, it is symbolic of the cross. What Jesus has done for us. But it's not just symbolic. 
There's so much more going on here. Yeah, that's true. It is symbolic of that. Let me look at Peter, and I love the apostle Peter, by the way. He's a knucklehead. He doesn't get it. But he says the right thing. When Jesus comes to him, he goes, Lord, are you going to wash my feet too? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. Don't wash my feet. You see, foot washing was very common during the time of Jesus. As a matter of fact, every person's house, they would have a basin of water so if a guest came over, they could wash their feet. If you had money and you had a couple servants, it was the servant's job to wash the feet of your guests as they came in. It was, it was commonplace. Peter knew about foot washing. It wasn't new to him. What was bizarre to him was like, no, no, Lord, you can't be the one that gets down on your knees and wash my feet. No, 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 that's a servant's job, not your job. That's not. And Peter's embarrassed by his feet. I got to tell you, I absolutely hate feet. That's why I think God's been giving me this washed feet for the last 18 months. I'm like, God, what are you doing? Feet are nasty. And guys, if you're wearing flip-flops and jeans, you can't be trusted. Ben Bonham, I know you're doing it right now. <laughs> dude, cover them things up. Buy some Hey Dude shoes, man. They're comfortable. Cover those feet up. I just don't trust people who wear flip-flops. Guys, wear flip-flops. There's something about feet. And I had my feet washed one time, and it, oh, it was awful. It was awful. We had a staff retreat about three, three and a half years ago. And we had a Friday evening and a Saturday. On Friday, I was mowing the yard, doing yard work. I completely lost track of time. And I didn't have time to take a shower. So I am nasty. I am funky. I, am, I, got, my, I got my lawn mowing clothes on. You know what I'm saying? And we go to the retreats and we go to this little church and we are worshiping together with this church and there are a couple of messages happening and then the elders say, okay, come forward, we want to wash your feet now. And panic just, oh, I was in full panic mode. First off, I have sensitive feet. I don't want you looking at my feet. I got ugly feet. They're nasty. I don't want you touching my feet. My wife can't touch my feet. And I get up here, I mean, I'm sweating. I'm a mess. And Larry, one of our elders, she just wanted to wash my feet. I said, dude, you asked for this. You asked for it. <laughs> I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. You know, when it comes to our feet, there really are reminders of our own imperfections. Bunions, corns, ingrown toenails, funky toes, athletes' foots. In some way, it represents our sin condition. Hairy feet. They represent our sin condition. And we're sometimes a little embarrassed by that. We want to cover that up. So Peter was right in saying, Lord, don't wash my feet. You can't do that. But then Jesus says this, you will not understand now, but later you will understand. Just a side note, sometimes things happen in our life that we will not understand why it is happening. And Jesus is appealing to Peter's faith. You believe in me. You trust in me. Continue to do that. Someday you're going to understand this. And no matter what it is you're going through, he's saying the same thing to you. Someday you're going to understand what you're going through. It might not be on this side of life, but someday you're going to understand. Trust in me. Stay with me. Then Jesus responds to Peter, because Peter says, no, you cannot, absolutely not wash my feet. He says, if I do not do this, you will not have a share with me. What, 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 what Jesus is saying to Peter is like, I'm inviting you into my life. You know, oftentimes you may have heard that our responsibility is to invite Jesus into our life. But that's not what happens in the gospel. It's not we invite Jesus into our lives. Jesus is inviting us into his life to participate in his life. And what he's doing with Peter, he's inviting him in to his life, a life filled with humility and grace and mercy and unconditional love. He says, no, 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 I want to invite you into that kind of life. That's why I'm doing this. I want you to have a share in my life. And Peter, and I love Peter, he's so strong-willed, but he's not stubborn. He's like, oh, well, then not just my feet, my hands, my head, wash everything, Lord. He's a knucklehead. He doesn't get it. He's got bad theology. But he's willing to be open to be corrected. 
Jesus says, those who are clean, those who have been bathed, are already clean. What's, what's he mean by that? If you pick up in John 15 real quick, John 15, 3 says this. This is what John says. Is, already you are clean. And why are you clean? Because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus' words. He says, you are clean because you believe in me. You are clean because of your faith in me. You are clean because you are trusting in me. You're already clean. You're, you trust in who I say that I am. And washing feet is an act of humility. It's a daily dependence upon Christ. We need him every single day. He continues to take our sin. It's a reminder of repentance and dependence upon Christ. So we see the foot washing scene is about, it's, it's symbolic of the cross and what he's done for us. But it's more than that. It's also we see Peter, we see repentance and dependence upon Christ. It's that, but it's even more than that. And this is where it gets really complicated. So far, it's easy to kind of track. Yeah, okay, yeah, he did that for me. Yeah, I repent. I, you know, I trust in him more. I get that. But then Jesus says, this is an example for you. Do as I have done for you. And he washes Peter's feet. He will deny him three times in just a few moments. But, but Peter repents eventually. I mean, Peter's a changed man. Look at the epistles of Peter. He says things like, be patient in suffering. Suffering is better than gold because you are refined. It grows. It tests your faith. The different person, he's transformed. But where it gets complicated is that Jesus washes the feet of Judas Iscariot. He washes his feet, and just a moment, he's going to walk out and betray him. And Jesus says, do as I have done for you. <laughs> Wait, Jesus, what? Okay, I get that you died for me. You know, I see the cross. And yes, I need to depend upon you for all things, but whoa, whoa, whoa. I got to love even, I got to wash the feet of Judas Iscariot too. Not just believers, but Judas it's like, absolutely. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, you heard it say that love your neighbor as yourself and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute against you. What he's saying there in the Sermon on the Mount, wash your enemy's feet. That's what he's saying. Like, whoa, Jesus, uh, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I don't want to wash my neighbor's feet who's a thorn in my side. But Jesus meets us right where we are, steeped in our own sin. I think the main reason for the foot washing scene is not just symbolism. And it's not just we need to repent. Jesus is defining to us what love actually looks like. This is what agape love looks like. You know, as Christians, we've heard the idea of, you know, carry your cross. Pick up your cross and carry it. Die to yourself. I mean, what's that actually mean? I stop cussing? Stop drinking? Stop having road rage? What is it? And Jesus says, carrying your cross is washing feet. That's what it means to carry your cross, to die to oneself. Because when we wash feet, we have to lower ourselves and take on the filth, the ugliness, the sin of someone else. Jesus says, do what I have done for you. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I mean, it sounds simple, right? Just wash feet. But it's so very hard to do. Because we'll make reasons why we shouldn't do that for someone else. So that person's not a Christian. Uh, that person's lifestyle. Uh, that person looks different to me. Different politics. Jesus says, I don't care. 
I want you to be for them. I want you to love them. And this is how you love them. You wash feet. You wash feet. But here's, here's the really good news, church. Here's the really, really good news. And a reason for us to celebrate. Is that he bows down in front of us and he washes my feet. And he washes your feet. No matter what you have done, no matter the sin that you have, he doesn't care. He, wash, he takes it. He doesn't condemn. He doesn't judge. He doesn't cast you to the side. He continues to wash our feet because that's how much he loves you and me. Hey, man, I don't know about you, but it, it's humbling. No, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. If you've known what I've done, you, you wouldn't want to do that. It's like, son, give it to me. I want it. And the other thing that's really good about this is that when we actually humble ourselves to serve someone else, to wash someone else's feet, God reveals himself to us. And the most unlikely of people. And my name is through Christians. Believers. He'll reveal himself because when you humble yourself and serve Christ, he reveals himself to those. There's a quote to a spiritual mentor to several of us here on staff, and his spiritual mentor, Father Emiliano, passed away last year, but he wrote this book, and he has this quote talking about this, and it's really just, it's home. Because man will not bow down to God. God, in his infinite humility, bows down to man. On the night he was betrayed, Christ set aside his garments. He stooped down to wash the feet of a man who would deny him three times and one who would betray him. That's how God was with the people of Israel. That's how God is with everyone, and that's how God is with you and me. God is not God if he is not humble. And neither can I be more like him unless I humble myself. The more humble we are, the more God will reveal himself to us. When we take on the towel of a servant, it's amazing what God will do in our own lives. When we are for them, it's amazing what he will do in us. So how do we wash feet? Metaphorically speaking, Mother Teresa, and I know you know who she is. She spent most of her life in Calcutta, serving the poorest of the poor. And on one day, she's walking down this really, really poor street, and there was a man lying in the street, almost dead. And all he had on him was a little bit of a rag. That was it. He was funky. He smelled terrible. or flies all around him. Mother Teresa got down on her knees and spoke gently to him. And started picking maggots that were nestled in his skin. Someone walked by and goes, oh my gosh, that is so disgusting. I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And she overheard him. She said, nor would I. She said, the greatest disease in this world isn't cancer. It isn't leprosy. It isn't AIDS. It's not being wanted. It's not being cared for. It's not being loved. It's not someone being for them. She says, do ordinary things with extraordinary love. You know, the people that she helped, they still died. And you know what? We are too. We're going to die in this world. But the ultimate healing this people had is being accepted, is being wanted, is being loved. As God loves us. There's no greater feeling in the world that God comes down in the world, gets on his knees and accepts me for who I am and loves me and brings me into his life. What kind of world would this be if we would get on our knees 
I'm not worried about who's right or wrong. I'm not worried about fixing someone, saving someone. What if we just worried about them? They know that I am for them, no matter what. So how does this look in our lives? You know, the reason why Jesus does the foot washing, because the cross seems so huge and heroic. I mean, on the cross, Jesus conquered death. And sometimes we're looking for those heroic events to serve someone. But foot washing is mundane. It's day to day. You don't have to go looking for it. It's all around you. It's your spouse. It's your kids. It's your neighbor. At the ball fields. At the gas station. At the grocery store. Jesus gives you the field. He says, go and wash feet. So how do we do that? Well, church, can I just say to you, you don't have to always have the answer. You don't have to win an argument. You don't have to be right. Some parent at a baseball game is flipping out. Maybe you just don't say anything at all. But it's so hard to do on our own because everything in me doesn't want to do that. But Christ says, son, I have never forsaken you. I am with you. Continue to trust in me. Continue to trust. Someday you're going to understand why I told you to do this. Mother Teresa said this, to grow in love, we must keep on loving and loving and giving and giving till it hurts. Because that's what Jesus did for us. Let us do ordinary things with extraordinary love. That's before them, church. What kind of world would this be if we got on our knees and washed our neighbor's feet? Lord, I thank you that what you see in me isn't the sin, it isn't the imperfections. You see a son, or you see a daughter, and you see just love, radical, crazy love. And all you want from us and from me is in my heart. Here I am. And Lord, every day you get on your knees and you wash our feet. And Lord, I feel so ashamed. I feel so guilty. But Lord, even in doing that, you take away our shame and you take away our guilt. And you empower us to love as you have loved us. So Lord, help us to be a people that find you and other people. Help us to be a people that humbles ourselves, not focused on outcomes and fixing, but focused on you. And Lord, may the greatest healing, which is love and acceptance and being wanted, permeate this country, this world, our lives. So we praise you now in Christ's name. Amen.